God for the blessed time of worship and also the exhortation at the table. We will now look into our final message. I request you to please turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 18. Book of 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 18. Can I read that, brother? Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? May the Lord bless this word and speak to us. In fact, as I said in the beginning, Brother Abby has set the tone for today's ministry by reading Psalm 8. Worship time also we have seen. Some we have learned a lesson from David's life, how to worship the Lord in every situation. During this final message also, we will learn one more lesson from David's life. This is a prayer of David in God's presence after Prophet Nathan delivers a message from God to David. Can we see that verse 8, same chapter, verse 8. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 8. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from this sheep court, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Verse 9 also. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. And one more verse, verse number 12. Same chapter, verse 12. And when thy days are fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. What a wonderful promise, in fact, promises that the Lord is giving it to David. He says, there will be no enemies for you, and I will establish a kingdom after you, and that is going to be there forever. God really loves David. After hearing all this, David humbles himself and says, Lord, what am I? Who am I that should be mindful of me? And what is my house that you should be so much concerned about? What humility this man has got. Normally, whenever we hear about David, if you Permit me to say so. There are two stories that we normally hear of David. In our Sunday school, we teach, teach, our, teach our children that David killed Goliath. That's normally taught in Sunday schools. As we grow, when we come to the youth meetings and or as we grow elders, we are taught about a sad story of David where he looked down from his roof, saw a woman, fell in sin, and also he committed murder. But there are so many good qualities in David which God has liked. Normally we don't focus on that. In fact, research has proved that it is the human tendency to focus only on our mistakes and weak points rather than our good works or strengths. You do 100 good things and if you do one mistake, people will remember you for that mistake and they'll forget all those 99. That's what happened to David also. We keep on hearing messages only about his failures, but we forget that God called this same man as the man after my own heart. Why did God say that? God will not do a mistake. This shows that there are so many wonderful qualities in David which our Lord liked 
and he loved him for those this morning we will we will see what are these qualities that the lord likes so much in him similarly whenever we think of zona we are taught from sunday school that jona disobeyed god and instead of going to nineveh he went to tarshish also we heard during the table message also peter denied the lord thrice in spite of prior warning but we don't recollect that david had better qualities which the lord liked jonah's gospel saved 120000 people from destruction and jesus made peter the rock on which he would build his church so certainly today let us look into david's life what is it that the lord loves him so much surely david has failed he has done terrible things but still god says this is the man after my own heart as the time permits we will see some of the qualities that are imbibed in david's life the first and foremost quality we have seen during the worship message at all times in every situation whether it is good bad joyous sad depression even life threatening david had this one wonderful quality of worshiping praising the lord for that quality normally in our lives when are supposed we get a promotion there is prosperity in business yeah we want to have a thanksgiving meeting we want to worship the lord but when there is a job loss or where there is financial difficulties normally our hearts are not full of worship but here is a man in every situation morning we saw one example from psalm 34 we will see one more example from second samuel chapter 15 and verse 30 book of second samuel chapter 15 verse 30 david went up by the ascent of mount olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot and all the people that was with him covered every man his head and they went up weeping as they went up now when we see this portion terrible situation david is in he doesn't have footwear he's covered his head barefoot is walking and the people are also crying weeping in fact it says and they were going up what were they going up for the mountain to cry there and to weep can we turn to verse 32 please verse 32 same chapter verse 32 David was come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God. What a wonderful sentence this is! This man walking barefoot, in terrible agony, in pain, in weeping, he is going up to the mountain because there is a place of worship. He wants to worship the Lord. What a wonderful man he is! We know the incident of Paul and Silas. They both were arrested. they were kept in a prison suddenly there was an earthquake the foundations of the prison were shaken the doors were opened and the bonds were loosened what material did they use did they use any gunpowder no as per acts 16 and verse 25 they sang praises to god acts 16 verse 25 and at midnight paul and silas prayed and sang praises unto god and the prisoners heard them singing praises to god has shaken the foundations of the prison the doors were opened azar and their bonds were loosened what strength is there in praising god similarly we know how did the walls of jericho come down what kind of explosive material or dynamites were used to bring them down it is praising god with trumpets that brought down these mighty walls one god servant said like this your worship will change your situation if you permit me to use telugu it goes like this stuti ni sthiti ni marustundi or in hindi stuti aapka sthiti badal deti hai it's true in fact 
That's what we have read. David was a shepherd boy. Normally, where do the shepherds sit? In a forest. They may be sitting on a stone, looking after the cattle. But his situation changed so much from that stone. God has taken him high enough to keep him on the throne of a king. Maybe he had a turban on his head to protect himself against the sun. <clears throat> In place of the turban, God gave him a king's crown. He must have had a wooden rod in his hand. God replaced it with a golden royal mace in his hand. <coughs> his old dirty clothes were taken out and royal garments were given to him. All this happened because David learned to worship. His worship changed his situation. Stuti stithini marchindi. What a wonderful truth this is we need to learn. Let us also learn this important thing in our lives. Whatever may be the situation, whether you're in difficulty, problem, loss of job, death of the dear ones, just praise God. Because he knows everything. He is in control of everything. This is the first lesson we can learn from David's life. Second lesson is, he was a man of prayer. David fought many wars during his lifetime. War means naturally emergency. You don't have time for anything. Quickly you will have to get and face the enemy. But we find many portions in the Bible that whenever he was surrounded by his enemy, David would surrender to God in prayer. He would ask God, God, should I fight this battle? Should I go? Let, let it be the emergency or what time, whatever it is, he would ask God. God would tell him, David, go. I will give the enemy into your hands. He will be your captive. Or he will say, David, be still. The war is not yours. It is my war. I'll fight that war. And God gave him so many victories that way. In fact, God gave us this wonderful weapon called a prayer. It's our armor. But sadly, for various reasons, many of us, we are not able to use it. We preach about prayer. We hear about prayer. But when it comes to praying, we fail. We have many preachers. You just turn on your TV. Oh, so many of them will be preaching. <coughs> but actually, in, in place of 10 preachers, if you have one prayer warrior in your church, God can do wonders. In fact, one man, man of God says, anyone who can preach for one hour, ask him to pray for one hour, you will know his spirituality. It's very difficult. You cannot pray. You, you kneel down to pray. Close your eyes. Start your prayer. Five minutes, ten minutes. Your thoughts go somewhere. Your mind is wandering, but you're not able to focus. But if you can, like David, be in prayer, you will see victory. Another man said one thing which I liked very much. He said, if you're not talking to God, please don't talk about God. I hope you got me. I'll repeat that. He said, if you are not talking to God, don't talk about me. It's true in the life of our dear brother Bhakt Singh. I'm sure you have heard it many a times. I would like to repeat it. Night, his assistants will come to prepare his bed a crisp white bed sheet and a nice pillow is kept there, water is kept. They leave, he'll kneel down there and he'll start talking to God. Twelve in the night, one, two, four, five, six early morning. And these people come there to set the bed again or maybe they come with a cup of tea. What they find there surprise them. The bed sheet is unruffled. The pillow is not used. What does it mean? This servant of God has been talking to God throughout the night. He didn't sleep a wink. Does it mean that his eyes are sunken? Is he weak? Next morning, when he comes into the compound of Hebron, his face will be shining. When he goes onto the stage, people weep and cry and lift up their hands and confess. Accept Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. 
This is the strength of talking to God. I can talk about somebody whom I do not know. I know John Dunaboyna. I can tell few things about him, where he lives, what is his family and all. I know nothing about Brother Hebe. I won't be able to tell anything. Same thing with God. You can talk only if you talk to him. I hope we got this truth. This is the secret of David, wonderful quality. He would talk to God for everything. God would answer him. That's the reason he had victories. This is the second quality. Thirdly, he would look to God and depend on God in every situation. Many times he fought these wars and he got victory. We know he went to fight Goliath. He, in fact, he did not go to fight Goliath. His father asked him to take food for his brothers who are in the war. When David goes there, he finds this giant challenging the people of God every morning and evening. In fact, I like this chap Goliath because he's a very reasonable guy. He says, let, the, let there not be any bloodshed unnecessarily. Somebody come and fight with me. Supposing I lose, our people will be your slaves. We will serve you. Or if you lose, you be our servants, you serve us. Fair enough, isn't it? But when David sees this man, he, he becomes very annoyed. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He is challenging. The king is afraid. Soldiers are afraid. No one is able to do anything. Now, King David says, sorry, this boy David says, I want to fight this man. We know this war has taken so many twists and turns. In fact, when I read this portion, it baffles me. Normally, war happens between who? Between a king and another king. In other words, between his army and the other's army. Now, what happened here? War is between a boy and a giant, between David and Goliath. Is it fair? But th that's how it is taken at a turn. Now, one more interesting turn. Now, this man starts to curse David, Goliath. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43. Second, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel, excuse me. 1 Samuel chapter 17, Verse 43. This verse says the last portion, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He's become so bold and courageous. He saw this tender boy and he says, Do you think you have come to I mean, a dog that you're coming with a stick? And he took the name of his gods and started. Cursing David. Now David got a bright idea. All right, this man is taking the name of his gods who are lifeless. Let me take the name of my God, verse 45. Chapter 17 and verse 45. First Samuel. And, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now, how interesting this is, isn't it? King is not fighting the king. Armies are not fighting amongst themselves. David is not fighting Goliath. The God of armies, the Lord of hosts, is fighting a lifeless God. Now, a God of armies doesn't need a spear, an arrow, or a shield. He told David, God, he said, David, don't bother about all that. Take that small stone that you have with me. Go, go ahead with this. That stone worked like an AK-47. And we, we, are, we know what happened after that. With his own sword, David cut off his head and he got victory. What a wonderful experience this is. That's why in Psalm 121 he says, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. From where comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. What a wonderful testimony. Every situation, he lifts up his eyes to the Lord and help comes from him. When we compare ourselves with David, we also have many troubles. We also have trials. But that time, where do we look? Many times I have looked to my friends. 
I look to my uncles. They have some influential friends, politicians, recommendations. But nothing works many a times. Then we go to the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. You help me. I am helpless. It's nothing wrong. You can go to your friends, go to your brother, go to your sister for help. But the first thing, what we learn from David's life, go to God in prayer. Ask God, God, this is a problem. He will guide you. He will tell us, you go to this person, through him I'll move and you will have victory. What a wonderful testimony this is of David. This is the third wonderful quality David had. Now let us see the fourth quality. David is the first person to confess his sin. We know that after his sin, Prophet Nathan came to David and he tells him, you are the man who did that heinous crime. David can easily shut Nathan's mouth or if he wants, he can even chop off his head. He's all powerful. Nobody can go to king and say, you have done a mistake. But David immediately confessed and said, yes, I sin. He did not cover up his sin. We have the habit of covering up our sins, isn't it? So many excuses we give. So many reasons we give. Oh, no, no, I didn't think it this way. I thought that way. But David did not do that. There's a man in the Bible who was an army officer. He would wear a nice uniform, had socks, shoes, maybe hand gloves. And people, when they look at him, they would say, oh, what a handsome man, what a warrior. But this man, when he goes home, he removes his uniform. His body was full of leprosy. His name was Naman. We, also, we all know that. How long could he cover his leprosy? One day he had to come to Lord Jesus Christ for healing. Bible says sin is equal to leprosy. Many of us, we try to cover up our sins and we can never be happy or we can never be saved with that covering. If there's anyone who is watching this message, if your sins are still not forgiven, please don't continue to cover your sins. Come to Lord Jesus Christ. Bible says, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. We all need God's mercy. By our own deeds, by giving money, by doing fast, we can never obtain mercy. The secret to get God's mercy is if we confess and forsake them, God is ready to forgive. Today is the day of salvation. You can accept even now. You will have joy. You will have peace. The Lord who healed Naaman of his leprosy can also heal you of your sins. Don't postpone it, please. You will have wonderful life after confessing your sins. David did that and his terrible sin was forgiven. In Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and clean me from my sin. Purge me with his soap. I shall be clean. Cast me not away from your presence. What a, what a humble prayer. I, I don't know if he has been crying while doing this prayer. He says, cast me not away from your presence. David knows very well, if he does not confess, he will meet the same fate as Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do? Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They sinned. But when God confronted them, they started to cover it up. Adam said, Eve gave it to me. Eve said, the serpent deceived me. It went on like that. What happened to them? God sent them away from his presence. That's why David says, Lord, cast me not away from your presence. I know what happens if I don't confess. Same thing happened to Cain also. Cain kills his brother and then he tries to cover it up. So many excuses he gave. He was sent away from God's presence. Same thing with, we know who the person, Iscariot, Judas Iscariot. He sold God, Lord Jesus Christ. And it was night, he went out, it says, Bible says. The moment you sin, if you do not confess, 
the biggest loss for us is we lose God's presence. David, aware of all this, he says, Lord, please wash me, purge me with her soap. I have sinned. Can we have that quality? We are all weak people. We fail. We falter. Many a time. That's why God has given us this wonderful provision of the table. Every week when we come there, we need to confess. We may not confess to each other, but we must sincerely confess before God and say, Lord, forgive me, purge me. And God is willing. He is willing to restore. This is the fourth wonderful quality in David. One more quality we will see and close. Fifthly, he was very happy to give for God's house, for God's work. We know David wanted to build a house of God. But God told him, you cannot do that, David, because you fought so many wars. There is so much blood on your hands. But I want your son, Solomon, to build that house. I will allow him to do that. David could have said, oh, why should I bother? My name is not written there. All the credit goes to Solomon. Did he say that? But David toiled and collected so much gold, silver. When you read that, those figures will surprise you. But if you read 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 14. 1 Chronicles 22, 14. Now behold, in my trouble, I have prepared for the house of the Lord. That word, in my trouble, surprised me. That means not when everything is all right. He had troubles. He was running for his life. He was fighting battles. Nevertheless, he wanted to prepare for the house of the Lord. A hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver. Telugu, it says, Rendu Lakshala. Sulamula Bangar, you cannot even imagine that. It's not sand or, or cement. This is gold, pure gold that too. And of brass and iron, without weight. You cannot even count the weight. For it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have it prepared. And thou mayest add there too. Can you imagine this? Precious stones, precious clothes, all that he has collected and he contributed to God's house. Now, when we read this, one thought comes to my mind. You may not be able to give gold and silver for God's house. You may not be able to contribute money, but are we cooperating in God's work? Well, you might say, oh, I'm giving my tithe, brother. What is tithe? Tithe is pittance. God, it's all God's money, in fact. God's word says, the Gold, silver, all the sheep, cattle on 10,000 mountains is mine. What is that we are giving it to God? Nothing. God really doesn't want our money. What he wants is our effort, our cooperation in God's work. If, if, if we extend our help, our cooperation, God will certainly bless us. This is the fifth important lesson that we can, he, his heart always long, he wanted to be, build a magnificent temple for the God. And that happened, may not, in, may not be in his time, but in son's time. So David always, not only this, he gave from his personal account also, we won't have time to read all those portions. This plenty he collected, and in addition to that, from his personal account, he gave so much to God's house. These are some of the qualities God liked in David. And he called him, this is the man after my heart. He has sinned. He has failed. He has confessed. I love him. I accepted him. I'll restore him. Today, in Israel, we all know the name of David is given so much of reverence. City of David, it's called. These are all the descendants of David. So this afternoon, as we meditate on David's life, these five lessons, can we also follow? Can we imbibe in them? Many a times what we do when we give messages or when we hear messages, we either criticize them or we appreciate. <clears throat> we will say the people of Israel were very disobedient. How about us? How many times we have been disobedient to God? 
or we will say, oh, Paul has fought a very good fight. That's fine. How about your fight? Are you fighting a good fight or are you fighting in the church with the others? So these five qualities, the first quality, he was a worshiper in every situation. Secondly, he prayed and got victory over his enemies in every battle. He was a man of prayer. Thirdly, he looked to God in every situation and depended on him and God guided him. Fourthly, he was ready to confess his sins. He never hid them. He was the first one. Like a baby, he cried. Being a king, he said, Oh, I have sinned. Have mercy. God likes it. That is the fourth quality. The fifth one, he gave joyfully all that he has collected and wholeheartedly for God's work. Let us compare ourselves and see where we stand here. May the Lord help us to understand these truths and follow at least some of them in this new year. One month is almost gone. We are entering into the second month and there are 11 more months. These five truths, let us try to practice from today in our lives and in our family lives. God will love them. May God bless this word. Amen.